now yeah there we go well good morning welcome to st luke's my name is lizzie part of the clergy team here and it's a joy to welcome you here this morning we are going to worship together we're going to look at god's word together our kids are going to um, share with us why we've got ribbons up and we've got a balloon arch going on we're going to do all of that in a few moments time but before we do any of that we are going to worship god as a family together so can i encourage you do you want to stand to your feet if you have little ones you might want to bring them forward so they can see the actions. Egwila is going to lead us in some actions that you might find helpful to do, you might not, but if you do, then please do join in. We're going to show family together, worshipping together. So let me pray as we do that. Father God, thank you so much that you are here, that you love it when we worship you, you love it when all ages worship you together. And so would you help us now to hear your voice, 
to know that you're right here with us. Jesus, would you help us to worship you now? Amen. Enormous boats that kept the birds and animals afloat. The Lord was good, the Lord was strong, and no one lived his life in him. God is love, a 
that is our prayer, that you would draw near to us, that you would come and you would be close, that we would sense your presence amongst us, from the youngest to the oldest. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please do take a seat. And kids, if you're at the back, I need you. At the front, particularly, I need you. If you were at Holiday Club this week, Lyra, I need you. Caleb, I need you. Noah, I need you. Stella? Yeah. Uh, Teddy's hiding. That's fair enough. Miller's still on the stage. Who else is at? Leo is at Holiday Club. Victoria, Peyton, Peyton do you want to come up? Henry. Do you want to come? You want to come up? Come up, come up. Thomas, not Henry. <laughs> Uh, great. Uh, who else? Brilliant. Well, this group of people and some lovely helpers. There's some photos, um, David, on the thing. We had fun, didn't we, this week? Does anyone want to tell us what we were doing this week? Lyra, what were we doing this week? Worshipping God. Worshipping God! We were worshipping God. What else were we doing this week? What else were we doing this week? You guys went at Holiday Club, but do you want to tell me what you were doing this week anyway? Yeah? We went to Italy. Great, then we went to Italy. That's brilliant. Not at Holiday Club. We didn't take everyone to Holiday Club. Our budget didn't stretch for that. Um, uh, Noah, what were we doing this week? Can you tell me your favourite thing from this week? Doing crafts. Doing crafts. Which craft did you particularly love? All of them. All of them. Brilliant, brilliant. So we did crafts. We did singing. Caleb, what was your highlight? Probably... Playing. Playing. Yeah, we had a lot of fun playing. We had a bouncy castle on the final day. We had three days in here, which is why we've got ribbons. It's why we have got um, these balloon arch. Egwala, do you want to tell us a bit about the theme, what we were looking at? So we dived deep into the sea and looked at three things about Jesus. His birth, his miracles, and then a death and resurrection. So we looked deep at what that means for us and how much he loves us. Amazing. And how many kids did we have who came to one of the days? We had... 38 kids came through the doors. Um, 16 of those were St. Luke, Luke's kids. Brilliant. So the rest were not St. Luke's kids, which is so exciting. We've got to share something of what Jesus was doing in their lives. And it was so much fun. Um, Miller, what was your favourite thing? Maybe just grab Egwala's microphone. What was your favourite part of the week? Um, I liked meeting lots of new people. Yeah. And I also liked... Um, Mary, who was not Lizzie, she was, she was Mary. Not Lizzie. She was very and, much Lizzie. Yeah, I liked all the Marys, and I liked <laughs> all the stories that not Lizzie <laughs> demonstrated for us. Great. Awesome. Stella, did you want to share anything about Holiday Club? You're not sure? Stella loved it so much, she persuaded her mum to come back for a second day. That was my highlight. Um, I wonder, Thomas, did you want to share anything? Yeah. Um, I like the creative. You like the creative zone? Which did you like making? What was your favourite um, thing to make? Bracelets and necklaces. Bracelets and necklaces. We had a lot of fun. One of my other highlights was we made egg drops. Ethan stood standing at the top of a ladder throwing eggs uh, wrapped in cotton wool. And whose who's egg survived? Yeah, there was a great moment where the, the oldest team, the girls one survived and the boys one didn't. It was a moment. It was a moment. I think they got it back in dodgeball. Did you beat them at dodgeball? You're not sure. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Um, Leah, did you want to tell us anything? No. Anyone else want to tell us anything about Holiday Club? You want to tell us about Italy? Oh, you, Eva, you want to tell me something? Go on. God been baptised. God was baptised. Amazing, amazing. We remember God being baptised. Lyra? Um, I know a book about Mary getting her new, b uh, her new baby. Brilliant. Did we look at that? At Holiday Club. But I didn't bring it, but, but, but on Sunday I will bring it and show you. Brilliant. That is so good. Thank you. And we're going to end with something that's not related to Holiday Club. Final thing. Let's go. Uh, there are toys in Italy, even a minion. <laughs> there are toys in Italy, guys. Isn't that good to hear? Wow. Um, I want to say a massive thank you to Egwala, who did such a phenomenal job pulling it all together. And one thing you have to know about Aguila is she loves to compliment. So uh, if you're at Holiday Club, just give her a compliment today and see how she wants to hide. Um, let's, uh, we're just going to pray. 
you for what happened. Father, thank you so much for what happened this week at Holiday Club. Thank you for all the kids that came. Thank you for these kids here who, knew, who know you already, but got, went deeper with you. Thank you for those who are hearing about you for the first time. Jesus, we pray that the seed sown would go deep, that they would hear and know that you are the risen King who loves them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. Kids are going to go to their groups. If you are uh, 10 and above, you're going with Ethan and um, Esther out to the offices. The rest of you are going to make your way to those doors. And um, why don't we, as we kind of, that happens, turn to someone next to you, find out how many chocolate Easter eggs they've eaten so far, find out, you know, what's been their highlight of the Easter break, what they did in the sunshine yesterday, and we will gather back together in a few moments. Should we stand? We're going to worship again. It's weird how they're not transition. If there's a seat, a spare seat in front of you, why don't you just come forward? The kids always leave a big gap. You guys are at the front already. Come on, let's gather in. Let's gather in. We're going to worship. Yes. 
scripture from Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 3, which says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory.
every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other. Yes, you are. Jesus, the only
their life in the word of God is the one that is built on rock and the one that isn't is like a house built on sand that's washed away but the one that is built on rock is a firm foundation and it, and it just stay, it stays strong it weathers all the storms but he starts that passage with you know you call me Lord but you don't always obey what I my commands and that's, I read that last night, and it just really struck me. We sometimes can sing these songs like, Jesus, you're the name, you are holy. But we don't always live like he is the one that is the name above every name. We don't always obey his commands, do what he wants us to do, how he wants us to live our lives. sorry where our faith is weak, where our obedience is not strong. But Lord, would you again, would you start afresh, your mercies are new every morning, would you start afresh in us now? Lord, that we may build a firm foundation on your love, on your word, on your spirit.
draw close, you draw close to remind us of your love. To convict us of the places, the times when we have not lived up to your glory. We come to bring your healing. We come to redeem Jesus. So we thank you for what you're doing. Thank you that you are here. And we invite you, Spirit of God, to keep moving. As the worship, the sung worship ends, Lord, that, that we would stay in, in step with your spirit. We would stay listening out to you. We would experience the goodness of your presence. So, Spirit, we invite you to keep working in our lives. like to take a seat. Well, welcome. Welcome to St. Luke's. Particularly warm welcome if this is your first time, you're visiting, you're trying to figure out whether this is a place you might want to call home. My name is Lizzie. I'm part of the clergy team here. John, who is our vicar, is away this week having a holiday, much needed rest, so he's not here. Um, so you're left with me. I can only apologise. Um, uh, welcome also if you're joining us online. I realise I didn't say that earlier, but welcome to those of you who are joining online. We, uh, if you are new and you are trying to figure out whether this is a place you want to call home, can I encourage you to scan the QR code on the chair in front of you? And there is a button that says, I am new. That um, enables you to fill in your details, just your name and your email address. And all that simply does is um, it enables you to sign up to our mailing list and there's a WhatsApp broadcast list as well. But also then we are able to invite you around to dinner at John and Seuss's house. So you can find out a little bit more about the life of the church and we can find out a little bit more about your story. I'd really encourage you, even if you've been coming to St. Luke's for a few um, weeks or even years, I think there was someone who came to their newcomers seven years after they first started coming to St. Luke's. So if you've not been to a newcomers, we'd love to just connect with you over dinner. So please do um, scan that um, QR code and give us your details and hopefully we can find a date that will work. A couple of baskets are coming around. In one of them, there is chocolate. Feel free to munch away through those. The children have not eaten them this week, so that is pleasing. Um, and in the second basket, there is an envelope. The envelope enables you to start giving into the life of this church. We uh, believe we have a generous God, a God who calls us to be generous with all sorts of things, with our time, with our resources, but also with our money. And so particularly, this is a church where you call home and you're not yet regularly giving into the life of this church. Can I encourage you to grab one of those um, uh, envelopes and a form, fill it in, pray about it and, and consider what you might be able to give financially as a regular um, gift towards the work. The things like Holiday Club, you know, these things don't happen for free, right? They cost money and so thank you for those of you who regularly give. That enabled us to do think the ministry that we do in the week and what happens here on a Sunday morning. Uh, I think I only have one notice for you this morning. Isn't that great? Um, you know, life is about to start kicking off. Well, kind of two notices, really. This week, uh, Crumbs Ignite, our kind of midweek kids groups, re-kick back off. We're holding off. Uh, Alpha starts in a few more weeks at the beginning of May, and streams will start at a similar point. But... Um, the uh, main thing I need to tell you about is the APCM. Uh, someone was like, what on earth does that stand for this morning? It's the annual parochial church meeting. It's basically the AGM of our church. So once a year, all churches, all charities have to have a meeting where they vote in new members for their kind of church council and um, vote in new church wardens. And so that is happening on the 28th of April after the morning service. Um, particularly if you are on the electoral roll, please do come to that meeting it's really important that we have your voice your vote in that that you get to hear about what's happened over the last kind of 2002 that's what we're reflecting on and um what year are we in gosh i lost the year of my life right then 2003 we reflect back on what happened in 2003 and um you can hear 2023 what am i saying 2000 we're gonna reflect back on the last 20 years you know 2023, that is what we are reflecting on. Goodness me, it's been a long week. Um, and so come along to that, that after the service. Um, bring food for your kids. Uh, they'll picnic at the back somewhere and we'll hopefully be done within an hour, an hour and a half. But do put that date in your diary. 
That is all the notices. Isn't that great? You can tell it's like the start of term before anything actually kicks off. Um, so I'm going to invite Jesse. He's going to bring our reading for us today. We are in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58. There are, pew, there are Bibles, not on the pews because we don't have those. There are Bibles on the chairs. Grab one of those or it will be up on the screen. And pray for me because I'm speaking and who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 15, 51 to 58. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will also be changed. We, we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will raise imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, the, mort the mortal with the immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in the victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The death, the sting of the death is sin. The power of the, si the, power of the sin is the law. But thanks to be God, he gave us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. Thank you so much, Jesse. So we are taking a break from the series that we've been doing all about allegiance. So over the last few weeks, if you've been coming to St. Luke's, you will know we've been thinking about how Jesus is our king. Well, this last week and this week are taking a bit of a break from that series. And both John, John answered this question last week, and it's my turn to answer it this week. The question we are asking is this, what does the resurrection mean to me? What does the resurrection mean to me? I'd love you just to take 30 seconds and just think about that question. It might not mean very much to you, it might be a totally new concept, it, it might mean lots of different things, but why don't we just pause, and I'd love you just to reflect for yourself. What does the resurrection mean to you? 30 seconds. I wonder what you're thinking about. I wonder what it is that's going around your mind. And for me, I guess the answer is two things. The resurrection for me is both my anchor and my destination. It is my anchor. It is the thing that holds me steady. It's the thing that holds my faith when all the storms of life are blowing around me. And it is my destination. It is the place that lies ahead. I kind of would have loved Jesse to read the entirety of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because it is all about the resurrection. And if you have your Bibles, can I encourage you to keep it open um, at that, that section? And I think that you have this whole chapter where Paul is, is listing all this stuff in verses 3 to 8. You see that Paul is talking about the good news and how that is rooted in the resurrection. In verses 12 to 34, he's saying, in light of Christ's resurrection, that guarantees our own resurrection. And then in 35 to 33, Paul talks about the sort of body we might have um, given in the resurrection. And so you then land and, and you get to this point in um, verse um, 50, 53, 54. And it says this, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? 
The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You're like, whoa. And then you kind of think, verse 58, where's he going to go? And you're like, oh, maybe he's going to go something like, therefore, don't worry. Sit back, relax, because you know God's got it. He did the resurrection. He's totally got it. You're almost expecting it to be like, yeah, great. He's done it. It's fine. Guys, you're fine. But that is not what he says in verse 58. And this is a verse I'd love us to actually um, kind of focus in on today. In light of all that Paul has said about the resurrection, in light of the good news of it, in light of how it's rooted in history, in light of how Christ's resurrection guarantees our own, in light of the kind of resurrection body we're going to have, Paul says this, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, you can hear the longing in his voice, can't you? He's like, you're my family. Therefore, family, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Therefore, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Be rooted in this truth. You see, Paul doesn't want the Corinthians. The Corinthians, who've got all kinds of stuff going on in their church in Corinth at this point. Like some really dodgy stuff that you would be like, that is not okay to be happening in a church. He doesn't want them wandering anywhere away from the resurrection. Because he believes it is in the resurrection and the resurrection alone that a victory over our greatest enemies, sin and death, is to be found. And Paul's hope is not only for us as individuals, his hope that the resurrection has achieved is for all creation. Because Christ has been raised from the dead, now he's seated at God's right hand on high. And so he says he reigns. He's reigning over this whole thing. He's got a plan for all of creation. Paul is desperate that all would grasp this. And he's desperate that those who have already grasped it would not wander anywhere from it, that they would stay anchored to this truth. And for me, it's the historical event of the resurrection that anchors my faith. I grew up going to church. I basically can't remember a day when I haven't believed in Jesus. And some of you might share this similar story to me. Of um, I, I kind of grew up going to church, and in my teenage years particularly, I had like massive highs and massive lows with my faith. They were always high in the summer when I went to a Christian festival and like was singing with 10,000 other young people where like God's spirit seemed to be really there, where I was hearing an inspirational teaching, where there was always a nice boy to fancy and, you know, doing a bit of flirting there. Always my faith was really on point in the summer. September hit. School would come. Work would happen. Friends, questions, doubts, just the monotony, the boredom of my church, to be honest. And my faith would go down, it, it would lose its intensity. It would be kind of, it would start to falter. And then Easter would happen and I'd go to something called Spring Harvest, which was like another Christian festival. And so like, it'd be good again at Easter. But by July, I was really ready for another Christian festival. My faith was a roller coaster because it was based on my feelings. Whether I felt close to God, whether I felt like God was near me. And aged about 15, I went to Spring Harvest, in fact, and um, a a speaker, I still remember this talk today. That is impressive, isn't it? Like over 20 years later, I still remember this talk. He said to us, and I was 15, so I didn't really understand about these things before that point. You may well have already grasped this. He said to us, there were two types of truth in this world. The first is subjective truth. It's the truth that you believe, that it's your truth. It's the truth that, you know, like, I think my daughter is the best daughter in the entire world. You will disagree if you have a daughter, right? Like, it's the truth that I says, I think Marmite is actually amazing. Half of this room will disagree. It's the truth that says, um, I actually don't really like coffee that much. I think tea is way better, which I know is quite controversial to say in Kentish Town. So there you go. I just said it. Um, It's the truth that says, I genuinely think that WhatsApp voice notes should never have been invented. Please never watch that voice note me. Thanks. Those are my truths. I know you have your truths, right? Things that you believe to be true. 
There's a second type of truth, a truth that is objective, that remains true no matter what people think or what people feel about it, like gravity. So this guy got a book, and he got us all to be like, right, I want you to use all of your willpower to stop believing in gravity. I want you to think that gravity is not a thing for you. And so like, he got us all to like, picture this book, stare at it, and then he let, dropped the book. And he was like, guys, come on, you can do better than that. Like, really believe it's not true. Not that one yet, David, not that one yet. Uh, really believe that it's not true. Okay, go for it. Whatever we did, nothing would stop this book from falling. And, of, um, and, and I suddenly realized in that moment that my faith couldn't be rooted in subjective truth, a truth that was okay for me. You see, I needed a faith that was rooted in objective truth, in an event that happened in history, that whether I felt like it happened or not, whether I believed that it happened or not, whether I sensed that closeness to God that it happened or not, it still happened. I needed an objective truth. And so I needed to figure out whether I actually believed the resurrection happened. Did Jesus actually rise from the dead? Was he actually flesh and bones present amongst his disciples three days after he actually died? I had to figure that out. And so the resurrection, as I dug into it, became an anchor. As I explored the kind of history and the evidence of it, it became the thing that my faith became rooted in. And do you know what? Still today, there are mornings when I wake up and, you know, I'm ordained, right? But it still happens to me and I'm like, Am I just giving my entire life over to a lie? Like, is this all just made up? Is this just not real? And in those mornings, I basically now have a checklist. You see, yes, it helps me to remember where I've sensed God or where I've seen him answer prayers or the stories of other people. But the thing, sometimes though, like those stories aren't enough. Like you can't explain them away. Well, that was just a coincidence or, or that person maybe was making that thing up or overhyping that thing. Or I sometimes when I look at the news and I'm just like, what the flip is happening in our world? How can there be a loving God? There are points in my life when my faith is shaken. There in, can be whole seasons, months at end where we've been bombarded with challenges and work pressures critique, mental health stuff, personal pain, illness, hopelessness, or just the monotony of life. And we can ask that question, is this all true? And so it's on mornings like that, when I wake up and I have this checklist. Do I believe that Jesus was a real man who walked this earth? Yeah. Most, most historians would say yeah, like all the like legitimate ones would say yeah, Jesus actually was a man. Great, move on to the next question. Do I believe he died on the cross? Yeah. Sources outside of the New Testament testify to that. There is very little doubt that he actually died on a cross. Great, check. Next question. Do I believe he actually rose from the dead? Do I believe that the gospel writers are not just making it and I'm like, yeah, I think I do. I think I have been convinced by the evidence. Because otherwise, what did actually happen to his body? Where did it actually go? And, and what happened to his followers? How were they so afraid one minute and yet so passionate that this person they had seen and knew was dead is now alive again? They had energy and hope and they like started telling this to other people at, 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 at risk of their own lives. What happened to those followers if he didn't rise again? And, and why has our world shifted? Why 2,000 years ago is this one man who walked in a place that was the backwaters of Israel, why has his life impacted our world so much? If he was just a dead Messiah, then he was nothing to write home about. For me, the evidence is compelling. I am convinced that he did rise from the dead. 
And so I find myself going, yeah, check. Okay, so that means he's Lord. That means I get up, brush my teeth, and I follow him today. I wonder what it is that anchors your faith. When you wake up in the, with those mornings, with those questions, or maybe for some of you, it, you're still actually even trying to figure out whether it is you do believe this thing or not, whether it is true. What are you looking to? I would encourage you to name those things. And it might not be the checklist that I have. God works and speaks to us all in different ways. But I would encourage you to name the thing that holds you firm so that, that when the winds come, you know where you're going back to. But I would also encourage you that if you are not convinced or you haven't looked into the historical evidence for the resurrection, then do it. Because it will encourage you. you. Go to Alpha. Check out the Alpha Online Week 2 video. Whole section all about the evidence for the resurrection. You want to go more in deep depth? This book, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, it's quite an old book now, but really helpful as I was a teenager, loved reading it. If reading is not your thing, this podcast is brilliant. Uh, the Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God, episode 16, Did the Resurrection Really Happen? A Classicist Discovers the Living Christ. There is enough evidence out there that will give you encouragement. If you have not explored it for yourself, can I encourage you to? Even if it then just becomes a tool for sharing your faith with other people. But if your brain is like mine, this evidence helps that checklist on those mornings. You see, for me, the resurrection is the historical anchor for my faith. That doesn't change no matter what I wake up in the morning feeling like. It is the thing that keeps me standing firm. It is the thing that makes sure that I do not move from my faith in Christ. But the resurrection is more than just my anchor. It is also my destination. That verse again, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Well, how is Paul able to claim this? How is he able to claim that what we do now for Jesus is not in vain? For this, we need to go back to verse 20 of that same chapter, where Paul uses this word to describe Jesus' uh, um, Jesus's resurrection. He says, Jesus is the first fruit. The first fruit. Verse 20. But Jesus indeed has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of all who have fallen asleep. Now, I don't know about you, Alec, how often do you use the word first fruits in your everyday life? Like, you don't, right? Because we are not farmers, most of us. Any farmers in the room? Would be surprising. Kentish Town City Farm, anyone who works there? No? Okay. So most of us don't really use that word in everyday life, do we? But in Jesus' day, when Paul was writing this, he would have known, people would have known what that word meant. It was the first fig to appear on the fig tree that guaranteed that there was going to be a bigger harvest to come. It was the first grape on the vine that guaranteed that there was going to be grapes growing this year. It was the first bit of crop that guaranteed the rest was to come. It's like the trailer for a movie, guaranteeing that the movie, the big event, is going to happen. It's the deposit that you pay, guaranteeing that you are going to pay the rest of the money for that thing. Jesus' resurrection is the first, but it is not the only one. It is the first and the sign that there will be more. But it's more than just the sign. It's actually the way that it's possible for there be, to be more. It is his victory over sin and death that we get to benefit from. I play uh, netball on a Monday evening um, with some school mums. Um, it's a lot of fun. I'm very competitive. So if you want to see true Lizzie, come and watch me play netball on a Monday evening. Last Monday, our team had an absolute shocker. I could give you the excuse that it was raining, but genuinely it was like, 
if you don't know netball, these things are not going to mean anything to you. But we were all like offside most of the time. We all kept on doing footwork. We all kept on making stupid mistakes. Our passes were off. We like did ridiculous things that we knew we shouldn't be allowed to do, like little short passes. It was all over the place. One of our team members described us playing like an under 12 team. And I was like, yeah, that pretty much was what was happening on Monday night. Except for Abby. Abby is our goal shooter. Abby was on point on Monday night. Every time Abby got the ball in the D, she scored. So we won. It was great, right? But the thing is, Abby did it all, pretty much. The rest of us were all over the place. We all get the points. It's not Abby's name on the score sheet, it's our hoopster's name that gets the three points, right? I know, it's a great name, hoopsters. Um, you know, that is a little bit what it's like, right? Jesus did it all, and yet we get to ride on the coattails of his victory. He created the way, and we just get to follow behind. We are on his team, and he's done it. So we get to celebrate and be part of the victory. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's the first fruits, which means he is guaranteeing that there is more to come. And he's more than just a sign. He's the way that it is possible for the, our resurrection to happen. But thirdly, because he is the first fruits, he gives us a glimpse of what our resurrection may, will be like. We see in his resurrection that some things are utterly different. Like Mary, one of his closest friends, doesn't recognize him at first. Two of his friends had a whole long conversation walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus without realizing who this guy that they presumably had known for three years, they didn't know who he was. There was something different about him. He could walk through walls. That's pretty different. I don't think he could do that pre-resurrection. He was immortal. He didn't die. His body ascended to heaven. He sits as a body, as a human in heaven right now. There were some things that were different. But there were other things that are similar. He looks like a human. Mary doesn't confuse him for an angel in the garden. She confuses him for a gardener. He looks human. His scars are visible. Just think about that for a moment. I think that is remarkable. And I don't fully have that worked out what that means for us, but it seems that some of our pains that he will be healed and redeemed in the resurrection. His scars are visible. He walks and talks and eats and cooks. He knows his friends. He knows who they are. He knows their names. He knows their stories. He's touchable. And so is the first fruit. He is the first to be raised, as Paul writes, in an imperishable body. He is the blueprint for our resurrection. Similar, but different. It seems that God will use the raw material of this creation, but he will redeem it. And so this present body and this life is not useless because it is going to die. God will raise it to new life. And therefore, what you do with your body and what you do in this life matters. Early on in the book of Corinthians, Paul describes two different sorts of people. Both are Christians. Both are building on the foundation of Jesus. One, we are told in 1 Corinthians 3, is building with gold and silver and costly stones. Another with wood, hay and straw. And Paul goes on to say that on the day which is presumably shorthand for the day of the Lord, which the Jews understood to be the day of judgment and resurrection. On that day, if what has been built survive, some of it will survive and some of it will be burned up. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burnt up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Note that some things the builder is working at, survives. What we do in this life matters. What we do with our bodies in this life matters because it has the potential to be eternal. It has the potential to survive 
to be God's future in the present, and so it survives back through into God's future. I, I have a picture that I hope is helpful and I hope is accurate. This came from my own head, um, so if on the last day this is not how it is, please don't have a go, but I hope this is helpful and hope it, might, it helps me think about this. So we have this little, um, we're very fortunate that in Kentish Town we have a little garden. It's a little courtyard garden. And when we first moved in, this is what our garden looked like. It was overgrown. There was a hammock. Someone had left a hammock in our garden. It's like taking up half the garden. We didn't need a hammock. Um, there was weeds everywhere. But as we hacked through the weeds, we found some absolute gems. At one point, this garden had been well cared for. There were six beautiful rose bushes. There's this little apple tree that I've spoken about before. That, this year, I think is going to have apples. I'm excited. It's got, like, little buds growing on it. Um, and there were some raspberry bushes. Someone had planted things of beauty, and these things didn't need tearing up. So whilst we have totally revamped our garden, it looks very different from that now. There are elements of the previous owner's work. So if they were to come round, they'd be like, oh, that was the rose tree that we planted, uh, the, the rose bush that we planted. That was the apple tree that we put there. I wonder if, as we walk around the new creation, we will recognize things and people and works of creativity and know that through the power of the Spirit, that was partly our work. And I wonder if that will be the main reward to know something we gave our hand to now survives into all eternity. We live in anticipation that God will fill the whole earth with his glory, that he will transform the new heavens, the old heavens and earth into new, that he will raise his people, his children from the dead to populate and rule over this creation. Space, time, matter will be renewed. And so our job as the church is to partner with the Spirit and bring God's future into the present. And as we work to bring God's future into the present now, we know that it is not in vain. It will survive. Yes, there will be lots that will re need renewing, and I wonder if there will be a bit of rubbing out of some of our mucky fingerprints where we did things with mixed motives. But what we do for the Lord now will not be in vain. As we partner with the Spirit to build for God's kingdom in our workplaces, in our streets, on our estates, on our families, sports clubs, spheres of influence, it won't be wasted. It will not be in vain. And I do wonder if the things that last that will be celebrated will often be those small, unseen acts and moments of kindness. As we end, there's a beautiful couple of verses in Matthew 10, 40 and 42. This is what they say. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. And if anyone gives even a cup of water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. I wonder if lots of the things that we will see that survive are those small, unseen acts of kindness that God sees now that are not in vain. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Anchor yourselves to the resurrection and always give yourself to the work of the Lord. Because you know, your labor in the Lord, it's not in vain. Amen. Shall we stand? Spirit of God, we thank you for your presence. And we thank you for your resurrection. We thank you that it is the thing we can anchor ourselves to. 
It is the thing that gives us a sense of what our future will be like. It is the thing that means that we can work and act and serve and pray in this life, knowing that it is not in vain. It is not futile. So we invite you, Spirit, to renew our faith. those of us where faith feels shaken. Jesus, we pray that you would come and anchor it. Right now, would you anchor it? And for those who feel like what they're doing is unseen and futile and just does not know what difference it is making Spirit of God. We pray that you would begin to show us and encourage us in those things that we do, that we turn our hand to you, that will survive. That we would be people who would work for eternity, would work for the eternal. And where we have got our priorities wrong, we are sorry. Where we have worked for stuff that, that won't survive, or where we have worked with attitudes and ways that, that are not of your kingdom, we are sorry. We want to build with gold and silver. We want to build for your future here and now. So Spirit, would you come?
of someone sat on a beach watching the horizon and the sun and, and there was a sense of is this sunrise or sunset but then this realization that it kind of doesn't matter because it's whether it's the beginning or whether it's the end of something God is faithful God is faithful and so an encouragement that whether you're wrestling with something maybe that you know that it's the beginning or know that it's the end or maybe you're like in between season you're just trying to you can't quite figure out what is going on God is faithful. And finally, be a reminder that his sacrifice is enough. We would love to offer prayer this morning. If you're on the prayer team, can I invite you to come and grab a lanyard and just make your way to one side um, so that if people want to receive prayer, that they can come forward. We're going to sing one final song and then kind of service will be officially over. Um, please do go and collect your kids. Um, but if you do want to receive prayer, then, then come forward, come and be prayed for. We would love to um, do that. Be that one of these words that's spoken to you or something from today, or you just carrying something that actually you just long to bring to God this morning. And so may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest upon you and all those that you love now and forever. Praise the
darkness. In the darkness, we will wait without hope. Till from heaven, till from heaven came right, there was mercy to fulfill. To fulfill the law and prophets, to avert the king. From a throne, from a throne of endless glory. 